Dr. Foster, before we look at some of the main staging posts in relation to the development of, of or, or the, the research on heat treatment, c can you assist with this? You, you, you've told us about the informal relationship and links with uh, PFL, Dr. Smith and, and, and his colleagues. In, in terms of what was happening uh, in, in research and development terms and within commercial pharmaceutical companies, was there any um, relationship, established relationship between the research and development team at, at, at the PFC and any of the commercial companies or, or any other ways of getting information about what was being done? The short answer is no, but there was one sort of small detail. When I was at the Congress in Budapest in 1982, Baxter announced, announced that they were, heat, they were heat treating their product, but they didn't dis disclose how that was being done. And some time later, Dr. Prowse, who, who worked for the Edinburgh Transfusion Centre, um, actually knew that the new medical director of Baxter, because he'd worked with him in his previous career, and was able to phone him up and say, well, what, what are you doing? And he was told it was dry heat treatment at 70, 60 degrees for 72 hours. So we, we obtained that knowledge. I can't say exactly when we knew that, but that we eventually didn't discover that's what Baxter were doing. I also remember going to the, 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 the Stockholm World Federation of Haemophilia meeting and seeing a poster by Armour and asking the uh, presenters of the poster, I said, is that dry heat? And, and they sort of said, well, yes, but they looked very embarrassed that I'd had actually asked such a direct question of them because they thought that wasn't um, really the done thing. So in, um, y you would find out information, and, and we'll explore a couple of the examples, um, but you, you might find out information at international conferences, but it, in terms of any kind of <coughs> established means of, inf uh, of information sharing, the pharmaceutical companies... Is this right? Would essentially keep their work to themselves. Yes, for commercial that's, that's correct. This was commercially reasons. valuable information which they didn't disclose. Um, and then, um, in relation to um, non-commercial organisations in other countries, so equivalents of PFC or, or, or PFL or, or, or BPL in other nations, were, were there other national non-private? fractionation centres with whom you had any particular links? We had close, fairly close links with the Netherlands Red Cross and also with Commonwealth Serum Laboratories in Australia, but I don't remember any work taking place there on virus inactivation. Um, now, I'm, I'm going to um, go through some of the issues relating to heat treatment with you on a year-by-year -year basis. I'm not going to be looking at the very detailed accounts you've given on various occasions, including to the Penrose Inquiry, including in your statement here. Um, but just so that others um, are aware, there, there is, amongst other things, a um, fairly detailed chronology at PRSC 302291, starting on page 55. We don't need it on screen, um, uh, Sully. Um, uh, um, but that, that gives, by reference to particular months and particular dates, a number of the different specific events that were taking place. But I'm not going to go through it in that level of, of granular detail, but we, we do have that, that account from you, Dr Foster. But I am inevitably going to look at it at a slightly more general level. So if we think, first of all, of the period prior to 1980, is it right to understand that at the PFC... Um, there was no specific R&D work being undertaken in relation to viral inactivation. There was the viral removal work in, in relation to hepatitis B and, and, and supernine that you've referred to already. Not in relation to coagulation factors. But yes, sorry, I should have made that clear. Um, in, in 1980, is it right to understand that a, a key trigger was... Dr. Cash reporting to you in October 1980 what he'd heard about the work being undertaken by Berenberg. Is That's it? correct. Um, and if we look at PRSE 0003349, please. 
should, I think, be page 10. Page 10, please. You say at paragraph 5... I believe that the symposium in Bonn that was attended by Dr. Cash was the first public disclosure of the work of bearing on the pasteurization of factor VIII. Uh, an abstract of this presentation was not published until 1981. The 1980 paper of Heimberger cited the Bonn presentation must therefore have been written afterwards. Therefore, Dr. Cash and the other attendees of the symposium in Bonn in October 1980 would have been the first to learn of this development. I was informed directly by Dr. Cash that Bering had claimed to be able to pasteurise factor VIII. This was the first time I'd heard of this claim and was before I saw his letter of the 27th of October 1980 to Mr. Watt. I'm not aware that anyone at the PFC knew of this work by Bering prior to the information from Dr. Cash. And then top of the next page. I was quite shocked when I heard this claim as the notion that factor VIII might be able to be heat treated under conditions that would destroy hepatitis viruses was inconceivable to me. And, and then you set out a number of reasons in, in, in relation to, to that. Um, so j just so that we can get the, the, the timings clear, um, Dr. Cash came back from the, the, the conference or meeting in Bonn in October 1980 and reported to you what he'd heard. Yes, it was very casual. I mean, I actually sat down at lunch with him and he said, have you heard of this? So it was just a casual conversation over lunch. And, and then I left, left the canteen and I bumped into Frank Bolton and he said, have you heard John's telling us about this factory being pasteurised? He said, it can't possibly be true. It, must, it will turn out to be a mistake. So that's how shocking it was to all of us that that, that claim was being made. Now, pa pa pasteurisation had long been used in relation to albumin, is that right? That's correct. Um, and and pasteurisation itself was not a, a novel technique in, in, in any sense. Why was it so shocking then in relation to the, the, the claim that was being reported to you from Bonn? Because factory it was highly sensitive to, to, to heat and would lose its activity uh, very, very quickly when it was heated even at room temperature or slightly above room temperature, and I had direct experience of that. Um, other than the, the, you've reported the conversation with Dr. Cash, the, the conversation with, 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 with Dr. Bolton, were there then further discussions that you can recall in the remaining part of 1980 in relation to this possibility and, and, and whether PFC should be doing anything about I, it? I think that Dr. Cash had written formally to Mr. Watt about it, but I think the, 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 it was just sort of sinking in, how on earth could this be possible and what, what, could it, what could they have done to achieve this? It was something of a mystery. Um, if we go then to your witness statement to the inquiry, WYTN 6914001, please. Um, yes, we can pick it up at page 50. You say um, in, in the second paragraph on this page, research on heat treatment pasteurization was begun at PFC as soon as it became known that this might be feasible. And then if we go to... Sorry, forgive me when I find the correct page. Yes, um, page 62. And bottom of the page, you say the development of heat treatment had begun at PFC in 1981. This was aimed at removing the risks of hepatitis infection. It was being pursued as rapidly as possible at the time that these conferences took place. Now, um, in, in terms of the, the suggestion in the statement that, re, that the research on pasteurisation was begun at PFC as soon as it became known that, that this might be feasible, um, as I understand it, looking at the more detailed account of events, it's really the autumn of 1981 when the first um, 
work is, is actually undertaken. Is, is that right, in September? The first practical work. But the, we were all, I'd already obtained the document that was being translated uh, prior to that. So in a sense, the, the beginning of that process had already had started. Um, so what, it, what's the reason, if, if any, um, for the fact that the first practical work begins... I think around a year or just under a year after Dr Cash reports back from Bonn. Well, the Cash's report obviously was just a statement and there was no information provided as to how on earth this might have been achieved, so it was a complete mystery. It wasn't until I obtained a paper in May 1981 when I attended a meeting in Cambridge that there was any uh, information that would help us to begin to do some work on it, but that was written in German and I gave it to Dr. McLeod to get translated because he was working with a German colleague at Edinburgh University at the time. And it was at that time that I was taken ill. It was only when I returned in the middle of October that I discovered that Dr. McLeod had had the paper translated and had appreciated its importance and had started to do some practical work to try to verify what was in the paper. And do you know whether um, any attempts have been made um, at the PFC or indeed by PFL or BPL, um, to obtain the, the paper, the, I think it's the Heimberger paper, um, in, or, or to obtain from bearing any information about the work that they were doing prior to you getting a copy of the German paper at the, the Cambridge conference in May of 1981? I'm not aware of any, no. You, you've, you've said very candidly that, you, that it was thought that this was something that was in, almost inconceivable. Would it be right to understand then that although this was something that was being picked up by BFC, it, it wasn't seen as a, as a particular priority in the sense of something that needed to be done urgently? Is, is that fair? No, I think we gave it very high priority, but it... it be, we, when we began to look at it, it, we identified some of the issues that needed to be addressed, and that indicated avenues of further research that had to be undertaken, and that is what we did. So if we then pick matters up, I think, in, in 1982, um, perhaps at PRSC 000120, This is the study group meeting, January 1982. Um, I think it would follow from your earlier evidence that this is the first meeting That's of the correct. study group. Um, uh, we can see um, Dr. Cash is, in the first paragraph, opens the meeting with a brief resume of the need for convening the group, sets out the aims, agreed that one representative from each centre would speak on the work currently underway um, at his or her centre and research development proposals for the future. And then we see there's a uh, next paragraph is headed Edinburgh Centre, Dr. Prowse. We can see, thank you. And so it would appear Dr. Prowse pre presented some slides. Bottom of the page refers to safer products, viral inactivation, pasteurisation, irradiation, BPL, UV, high purity. Um, but before we go over to look at, um, at your own presentation, what, 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 if anything, was your understanding at, from this meeting about what was being done at the Edinburgh Centre by Dr Prowse? I don't think he was doing anything. He was just trying to brainstorm on, on some, of the op some of the areas that could be pursued. And then if we go over the page, we can pick matters up in relation to the PFC at the bottom of the page protein fractionation centre, Dr Foster, and then there's a summary of the talk that you gave reference to slides, and we can see that there's a discussion in relation to the work that you were undertaking on yield. And then if we go over the page, um, I'm not going to go through the detail of it, but again, there's a, there's a fairly detailed narrative about various um, um, areas of work being undertaken. Again, I think very much focused upon improvement in yield. If we then go to the next page and pick it up in the fourth paragraph, it says Dr Foster ended his talk with a resume of 
of PFC R&D current project priorities, which were reducing activation and process, develop high purity methods, reduce fill volume, effective plasma age, anticoagulant effects on plasma eight, cryo factor eight. So it would appear from this that as at January 1982, um, um, heat treatment or pasteurization was not a, 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 at that point a current priority. Is that fair? I don't think it's quite fair because Dr. McLeod hadn't completed the study he'd, he'd begun and he actually produced his first report shortly after this meeting, which then pointed the way forward. So I was really waiting for his findings before we commented on it. And then I think still in 1982, a, net, a, a further relevant event, I'm not suggesting these are the only developments taking place, but um, it is then the, the conference in Budapest. Um, so if we pick that up at PRSC 00003349. and go to page 17. Oh, sorry, we pick it up at page 16. Um, you refer in the bottom half of the page to the 1982 Congress, August um, um, in Budapest, obtaining documents from um, uh, Bering's stand. So, it, that, it, is that effectively the way in which, or the main way in which you were receiving information about what the commercial companies were doing at these international conferences? Correct, they had their trade stance. You had the armor poster, the bearing sun with various papers. You had to effectively pick things up from these conferences. Well, that was my practice, was to go around all these commercial exhibitions and fill my briefcase and then study them when I got home. Um, and then... Uh, bottom of the page, you say it was also at the 1982 ISBT Congress that I first learned of the concept of applying heat treatment to, to, to coagulation factor concentrates in the freeze-dried state, i.e. dry heat treatment. Um, uh, and then you, top of the next page, listed in the programme as poster presentations at which the authors would be present to answer questions on their work in the event the posters were not displayed nor were the authors present at the poster session to answer questions. Um, do, do you know um, whose work you were referring to there? The authors were called Rubenstein and Dodd. Um, so uh, what, what, it sounds as though the information that was available to you at that conference about their work was fairly limited. What, what, what actually did you glean at, the, at that point in time? According to the abstract, they had taken some vials of factor eight, heated them... I forget the time and temperature, but dry heat treatment, maybe 60 degrees for a number of hours. And they claimed the factor eight had survived, but in order to, to dissolve the product, it had to add more water than, than would normally be done, which, which actually made it not a clinically suitable product. But it was still uh, of interest that they managed to get factor eight activity back after that heat treatment. But they had no data on virus inactivation. And of course, freeze drying is used as a a means of stabilizing biological substances, including vaccines and viruses. So it's, you needed to have some data to show that you were activating viruses, and they didn't present that. And the fact that they hadn't displayed their poster or turned up suggested to me that maybe they had um, changed their mind about their work. Because in, in all of these presentations, these poster presentations, it's always very preliminary findings that are presented. And if somebody doesn't turn up to show their work, it often means that it hasn't withstood further examination and has been withdrawn. So that was something that crossed my mind at the time. So I, I, although I noted the, the, uh, the approach, there wasn't enough information here to make it seem worth pursuing at that time, uh, as far as I was concerned. Um, and then uh, in the next paragraph, you refer to the announcement at the conference from... Baxter, or Highland slash Baxter, that they developed a heat-treated factor eight concentrate. Is it right to understand, both from this paragraph and from what you said earlier, that that's all that was said at the conference? You didn't know whether that was through pasteurization or dry heat? That's correct. And so it's later through the conversation that you referred to and that's described here yes. um, that it's re uh, realised that it's dry heat? Yes. 
in, in very broad terms, Dr Foster, in 1982, what was the progress of PFC's work on heat treatment, which was, past, as, I say, as I understand it, pasteurisation only, not, not dry heating? Yes, as I just suggested earlier, Dr McLeod's initial study identified a number of further areas that we needed to address before we could apply the approach that Berenberg had, had, had made. I had already identified what seemed to me to be one of the causes of the instability in factor eight unheated, and I was beginning to address that. We also needed to reduce the fibrinogen content, um, hopefully without losing too much factor eight, and I discovered a way of doing that. And we also identified from the, from the scientific literature a stabilizer that we thought might be superior to the one that Berenberg had used. And we put all of those things together to be, uh, arrive at a, a, I'll say a, a process that could be applied to factor eight and factor nine with a much higher yield than Berenberg had achieved. Still a lot less than we were doing without heat treatment, but something that made it more, more of a practical proposition. And we then began to scale that up. And I think by the beginning of January 83, we were starting to get kind of larger scale preparations in the PFC pilot plant. And, and if just before we get to 1983, if we just look at a study group meeting from October of 1982, please. PRSC 302206. So it's the 14th of October, 1982. Um, and, and under the heading inactivation, so just, just further down the page, thank you. Um, it said heat treatment was now the first option of the group in view of developments which had occurred since the last meeting, uh, Dr. McLeod would have continued studies of heat process using high purity product, Edinburgh BTS, to assist if necessary. Um, the reference there to developments which had, had occurred since the last meeting is, is to what? As, as far well, as I think it's what I described a moment ago, all of the elements that needed to be researched and, and had, had actually, we made progress with those and we can now bring them together into um, something that would, would look like a, a process that might be a possibility to pursue. Um, and still focused solely on pasteurisation, yes. not dry heat. Yes. Um, but by this point in time, so if we say by the end of 1982, can you recall whether there have been any significant discussions between um, PFC and PFL about the, about the issue of, of heat treatment? I think we see rather more conversations going on from 1983 onwards, but can you, was, there, was there much well, of a dialogue up to this point in time? I sent Dr Smith a copy of my report from the Budapest conference, and I, to be honest, I don't remember what discussions we had around that time. I think Dr Smith did visit us shortly at the beginning of, Jan beginning of 1983 um, to discuss pasteurisation. Yes, I think, I think your, one of your chronologists records a visit by Dr Smith to the PFC um, to discuss, it just says to discuss coagulation factor research and development, 10th of February 1983. Um, if we then just look at a handful of documents in relation to 1983 itself, we start with PRSC 301554. And this is a memo from you to Mr. Watt dated the 11th of January 1983. Um, and it reads, it's now considered that a number of companies will be making heat treated factor eight concentrate available to clinicians in the very near future. Uh, this could well have major implications for the NHS users and suppliers of concentrate, and it's therefore recognised that there is some urgency in demonstrating that the NHS has the capability to manufacture products of this kind. Um, before we carry on, um, um, do you recall what further information you had by January 1983 about what was being done by various commercial companies? 
I'm not certain. It might have been one of the meetings that Frank Bolton was at, where he like the immuno the, the meeting that some he threw airport. Yes, that like was that. slightly later in January, but it, it was. wasn't a new development. So, so I, I can't remember other than that. But but it, is it right to understand from this that by January 1983 you were certainly aware that there were pharmaceutical companies claiming that they would be shortly able to to release heat treated concentrates. There was a, a lot of material at the Budapest conference about virus inactivation. Um, although not, not a lot of particularly useful information, but it, it showed that this was being now, now examined uh, by, by it, it, to a great extent by all of the companies. Um, and then if we just pick it up in the third paragraph, um, you say the PFC R&D program on this topic is advancing well. And in view of this, we've been given a target by Dr. Cash to prepare a small quantity of heat-treated material for clinical tests within three months, um, and then various other matters um, in relation to, to that set out. Um, is this a reference to the material that was subsequently, I think it was in fact rather, uh, rather later than three months, given to, um, I think, three patients... And, uh, and the patients where Dr. Lug one of Dr. Lugham's patients reported a, an adverse reaction. That's correct, yes. And that took rather longer than you were anticipating it would appear in this memo. Why was that? Uh, I can't, actually can't remember. If we then move to March 1983, look at a document that we've, we've already looked at, but um, I think we can perhaps look in more detail. PRSE 0001201, please. So this is a presentation you gave to the haematology department, at, or sorry, gave at the haematology department of the Royal Edinburgh Infirmary, 8th of March 1983, methods for preparing non-infective blood products. Um, do you recall who the audience was? And presumably it involved people from the RIE, but did it involve clinicians more widely from Scotland? Uh, I think it was simply staff from the, from the Royal Infirmary, but I can't be certain. I, I didn't know the, the individuals concerned. Um, and then if we go over the page, we can see there's reference to products from plasma fractionation, um, identification of low-risk products and high-risk products with factor eight and nine being identified in the, in the high-risk category. If we go over the page, we can see there's reference to hepatitis infectivity studies. Next page looks at hepatitis from immunoglobulin. And then the next page is headed some proposed solutions to the hepatitis problem. <clears throat> um, we looked at this yesterday in relation to what was said in the very bo bottom of the, the entry, but if we just look more generally, donor screening, product screening, that's for hepatitis B markers, vaccine for hepatitis B, problem screening not sensitive enough, poor, poor correlation between markers and infectivity, non-A, non-B hepatitis, and then the reference to other infectious agents, including A. So, um, um, c can you remember what was, in particular, what was behind your, your, your thinking in, in presenting this information to, um, to your audience? I was invited by Dr. Ludlam to make this presentation because he was aware that we were doing research on pasteurisation and he thought it would be helpful to have some um, more detailed presentation of the whole kind of area from a fractionation perspective to the staff of his department. And then if we go over the page, we can see a list of methods, or sorry, potential methods studied, um, accredited donors, um, removal of virus, and then the heading inactivation of virus. We can just look. So we've got specific, that's in relation to hepatitis B, and then non-specific, um, uh, reference to chemical, um, BPL, ultraviolet, detergent, then question mark, and then heat. J just before we look at the reference to heat, can you just talk us through what you were communicating in, in paragraph 3.2.1 there by the reference to chemical, the reference to BPL, and to detergent? BPL is beta propiolactone, which is a chemical combined with UV, have been shown to be quite effective in destroying viruses. The difficulty was how you integrate that into a manufacturing process especially 
knowing that beta prophylactone was a carcinogen and it was something that was pursued by this company, Biotest, uh, but nobody else pursued it. And I think bio, for factor eight, Biotest didn't achieve a product that was satisfactory. Um, detergent, we'd already considered this in, in, in uh, some of our meetings with our factor eight study group because it had been suggested by Duncan Pepper and there was a concern the detergent would only be, if, if it was effective, it would only be, again, be against lipid envelope viruses. And we didn't know if the agent that caused non-A and non-B was lipid enveloped or not. And if there was, in, if AIDS was caused by an infectious, infectious agent, it wasn't known if that would be lipid enveloped or not. So that was considered not to be um, a top priority at that point in time. Also, there would be an issue of removing the detergent from the product because you couldn't inject it into the patients. And that it wasn't known how that could be achieved either. So there were a number of issues there that caused us to put detergent at a quite a low priority at that time. But it shows that we were aware that Shangram had actually patented this method in 82. And then we've got the reference to heat. Uh, and can you just help us understand then the references on the right-hand side Abbott 77, um, ARC 81, I think Bearing Work 1979, that's a reference to the yes. actual patent, which um, uh, was, was dated 1979, but what, what are the references to Abbott well, and ARC? I, I can't be certain, but it, I think it might have been applying heat to another plasma protein called antithrombin-3, which was more uh, t tolerated heat more better than factor 8 and factor 9. And, and then, is that in relation to both those I publications? I think that probably is the case, but I, I'd need to trace those references up to find out. Um, and then you've got the reference there to Bearing Work and, and the 1979 patent. Um, by, by this time, and we're now in January, sorry, March 1983, what further information did you have about Bearing Work's work? Well, I had collected some papers that from the Budapest meeting which gave clinical data and um, it provided evidence that the product was, in, was, safe in, or was safe in patients with regard to transmission of hepatitis. But that was, although that, that, I thought that was useful because it, it showed that the, there was reasonable evidence that this was an effective procedure. It wasn't fully accepted by other people in the field, and in particular, Dr. Minucci, who was very critical of the way they obtained this data. And that led him to develop a, a, more, a more sophisticated scheme for uh, monitoring patients, which be, became known as the studies in previously untreated patients. And that, that followed on because Minucci was concerned that the burying of clinical data was inadequate. But from my point of view, there was some data it suggested it was worthwhile pursuing. Now, the next few pages of the presentation deal with um, the, the BPLUV um, work and, and, and the identification of problems in relation to chemical methods. And then um, there's a discussion of the Super 9 um, project. Um, can we turn on to, I think it's probably page 16, Sally. Sorry, I've not got a paginated document. Yes. Um, so here we've got heat treatment, 60 degrees, 10 hours. Um, and then you've listed the, the stabilizers on the left-hand side, the products on the right-hand side. And if we go down towards the bottom of the page, we've got there the reference to factor eight, factor nine, um, uh, reference to um, uh, then various other products, fibronectin. Um, and then over the page, we can see uh, what's said there to be pasteurization problems, concentration of virus, protection of virus by protein stabilizer, non-A, non-B cross-contamination after pasteurizing. And what, what, what was the, the state of the work that you were doing or, um, at PFC by this point in time, March 1983? We were beginning to take forward, excuse me, <coughs> our pasteurized um, process to scale it up and then 
have it working to a degree that we could transfer it into production to make clinical grade material to then have that um, used to find out if, if it was tolerated by the patients and if the factor eight was recovered normally and if the half-life was normal because there were still many people who thought this will turn out not, not to work in patients. It'll, it's all some kind of artifact that we're just seeing in the laboratory. And then if you go over the page, um, there's a, a slide or a note in relation to the Beringwerk process. Um, and then the next page refers to Highland um, at question mark heat process, question mark temperature, time, plasma spike, and then question mark yield. Um, and then there's a couple of references. So by March 1983, um, are you able to assist us with what, in, what you understood was being done by Highland? Not a lot, I think. It shows you that Dr. Krauss hadn't managed to get the information from them about how they were hitting the product by this date. So it was only after that that we got that, got that information. Um, we, we, it shows you here that we, we were aware that they'd done studies in chimpanzees and, and what the data were. But that's, that's all we knew. And then, um, if we move next in 1983, to PRSC 301111. Um, this is a document we looked at yesterday in, in, in relation to what it said about AIDS. If we can just look back at it now in, in terms of what it says about the heat treatment program. So it's the 3rd of May, you to Mr. Watt. Um, um, the first paragraph refers then to the objective of the heat treatment program. Until very recently, the objective of our heat treatment program was to cope with the hepatitis problem in haemophiliacs. Uh, and then if we can just look at the, the, um, the next paragraph and the, and the numbers one, two, and three. Um, you talk there about uh, um, the present strategy, and then you set that out. One, plan for a four to six pilot scale lots during 1983. Two, design a full scale plant to handle 30% of production for 1984-5 at the earliest. Three, mild and moderate haemophiliacs can continue to receive single donor cryo meanwhile. Just in relation to that third point, was it your understanding that mild and moderate haemophiliacs were being treated with cryoprecipitate rather than concentrates? Yes. Um, and then, um, can you just assist us in understanding the, the, the first two elements of, of what you describe as our present strategy? It is one the reference to what Dr. Cash had referred to earlier in, in, in the year, um, the uh, um, product that was going to be given on a, on a trial basis effectively to some, a handful of patients? No, it goes beyond that. It's, it's all, it's the proportion of factor eight that we thought we could produce that was pasteurized, that would be sufficient to treat this group of patients. And that was Dr. Cash's strategy and his estimates of what was needed. Bearing in mind that even with all the progress we'd made, the yield was still gonna be half what we were normally getting. And so it would have, if, if we'd applied this to all of our factor eight, we'd have had to reduce our output by half. The expectation here was if we, if we, we could, this smaller quantity, a third, that was pasteurized, that would be sufficient to deal with the patients that weren't already infected with non-A, non-B, and that we would have more time to then develop it further, to increase the yield further, so that we could apply that to all of our factor eight. And then you suggest in the next paragraph that it's the possibility of AIDS that means you may need to review this strategy. Um, uh, and then you set out Little Roman 1, Little Roman 2, and then you say in the absence of any hard data, heat treatment of everything looks at the moment to be the most likely possibility that we will have to face up to. And then if we go to the top of the next page, you, you refer there to the, there may therefore be a case for accelerating um, our heat treatment program. Um, now, we... we we looked within the inquiry last week, Dr. Foster, at written evidence um, from Dr. Smith and from Dr. Lane, and it, 
it might be argued, having regard to some of what was said in, 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 in their respective statements, that um, from the BPL, PFL perspective, um, whilst their work on heat treatment had begun, similar to PFC, um, because of a response to non-A, non-B hepatitis, it was the threat of AIDS that brought about a greater degree of, of urgency, a greater degree of prioritisation. That, that's an argument that some might, 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 might make having regard to that material. Is, is that what we're seeing here, Dr Foster, May 1983, that there's a, that there's a greater sense of urgency now in relation to, to, to heat treatment because of AIDS? No, it's not so much a greater sense of urgency on heat treatment, but it was a how, how that should be applied that it would have to be applied to all of the product, not just one third of the product. So that was a change of uh, perception, if you like. Um, if we then... Are, are we leaving this? Yes. Uh, I, I, let me just ask you this. Um, I don't think there's any reference in this paper to it. But my understanding is that in, in March 1983, so two months before this, roughly, um, the FDA had licensed the Highland heat-treated product. Had uh, that filtered through? I'm not sure if it had, but my understanding is that that would have been done on the basis of the chimpanzee data that I mentioned in my presentation to uh, the, the hemophilia group in the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary. Uh, I, we didn't have direct uh, contacts with the FDA, so I probably wouldn't have known of that at the time. And you, your American contacts, so if you had American contacts, wouldn't have, have mentioned it? Um, I don't remember ever being told that, no. Thank you. Um, and then... Can, can I just yes. follow that up? We knew that Baxter had developed this process, and they were going forward to clinical trials, and they must have had some regulatory basis for doing that. So kind of in, indirectly, we would have assumed that they had some approval. But what that approval was, we didn't know. I see. Um, uh, then if we move to June, July 1983, um, back to Stockholm, um, but not now for Dr. Evert's presentation, but for what you learned in relation to um, heat treatment, um, if we pick it up, PRSC 0002291, please, and go to page 56. Th this is part of the chronology provided to the Penrose inquiry. Um, uh, and if we look at the entry for the 27th of June to the 1st of July... Congress of World Federation of Haemophilia, Stockholm, poster from Armour on testing of heat-treated factor VIII in chimps. Authors reluctantly acknowledge to PRF that method is dry heat. Um, and then um, you refer to, to the Dr. Evert um, uh, um, presentation. Um, and then there's a suggestion of you approaching Dr. Johnson, New York, in, in relation to collaboration on a new method of purification. And, and then we can see in the next entry, you make your own presentation, which you've told us included the work on pasteurization at the ISTH Congress. What, 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 what more, if anything, can you recall learning from the Stockholm conference or either of the Stockholm conferences about the work in relation to heat treatment being undertaken elsewhere in the world? I don't think there was a great deal of information presented at that conference other than this poster by, by Armour. Um, last document for 1983, I think, um, is PRSC 0002581. This is a meeting of the Haemophilia and Blood Transfusion Working Group, 14th of November 1983, at which you were present. Um, uh, and if we look in the bottom half of the page, under the heading Heat Treated Factor VIII Concentrate, um, we can see there the report by Dr. Ludlam. And he'd received a supply of concentrate um, um, and reference to a patient experiencing minor adverse reactions. Dr. Forbes had just received a supply of material from a different batch, was about to put it to trial. 
Dr Foster informed members that four batches of the heat-treated material had been prepared, full-scale production was on target, and, and then there's a further discussion in relation to the batch which Dr Ludlam had received. So is it right to understand that then that by November you've got the, um, the trial batch of your pasteurised product provided to Edinburgh and to Glasgow, as we see described here, and then the initial report of the adverse reaction from That's Dr Ludlam. That brings us then into 1984. I, I think there were further reports in relation to th that, those batches and further reports um, from Dr. Ludlam um, um, in, in early 1984. But is it right to understand then in, in 1984, I think there were further communications between you and Dr. Smith uh, and discussions with Dr. Smith about the work he was undertaking. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, um, uh, w without going to the, the, the detail of the, the, the visits and the letters, what in broad terms was the exchange of information between you and, and, and Dr Smith and Mrs Winkleman in the course of 1984? Uh, basically, any, any new discovery that we made, I passed it on to Dr Smith. And he was also in discussion with Dr Pepper, who, who worked at the headquarters laboratory, because he was very friendly with him too. So there was this continual exchange of information. And you were aware that the PFL were looking at dry heat? Yes, I knew they were looking at that, but they still expressed an interest in pasteurisation, and they came to visit us to look at our pasteurisation process um, a number of times. And so it was, wasn't certain to me which route they were taking. I, thought, I think they were still open. It appeared to me that they still had no open mind about what they were going to do. Um, 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 why was it that by 1984, whether through knowing what Dr Smith was doing or otherwise, the focus at PFC was still on pasteurisation rather than dry heat? The focus was on pasteurisation because there was some evidence that it was effective in destroying the agent responsible for non-A, non-B. The opposite was the case with dry heat. There was ev the evidence had begun to emerge that Baxter's product had, that it was dry heated had continued to transmit non-A, non-B. And that's recorded in some notes that doc from, from one of the safety action groups of SNBTS in early 1984. So we were aware that the Baxter trial had basically failed. The method had not removed the, the, the risk of non-A, non-B hepatitis. The heat treatment that they were using didn't apply to, couldn't be applied to our existing product Dr. Cuthbertson and Dr. Pepper had found, discovered that. So it, from my point of view, or from our point of view, pasteurisation still seemed the most uh, appropriate way to focus our, our efforts. And, and then we come to November 1984 in a conference in Groningen. What, what was the significance of that in terms of your thinking and your work? Earlier today, we talked about what, what I'd done just before we went to that conference, and I had already initiated some dry, further dry heat treatment experiments, this time at 68 degrees, to discover what temperature our product could tolerate. And the preliminary data that I was given um, the evening before I left to go to Groningen was that our factor rate could tolerate heating at 68 degrees for three hours. At the Groningen conference, there was a presentation from a Dr. Jason of the CDC where she said I've got this information hot from the press and then she gave data on both dry heat treatment and pasteurization concerning um, samples that are factor 8 that have been to which um, HIV had been added and how much had been destroyed by the heat treatment process and that told me immediately that we, we, we could expect that dry heat treatment of 68 degrees for a relatively short time could destroy a considerable amount of HIV. And that was really um, the trigger for us coming back and proposing that we do that. And if we just pick up some specific dates at PRSC 0002291, page 58... Um, top of the page is the 11th pilot preparation of pasteurised factor 8. So th those are the various preparations being 
um, that, that Dr. McLeod had begun in September 1981. Is that right? This is That's the 11th correct, yes. iteration of that. Yes. Um, and then we see 26th of October is Dr. McClellan being informed by Dr. Ludlam about the um, possibility of PFC products having in, in, uh, transmitted HIV. Uh, 26th of October is that meeting of department heads that we looked at. Um, 30th of October, is this what you were referring to a moment ago? So oh, first yes, these, of these were the results of the study <coughs> that I had asked Mr. McCullen to carry out um, on, on the previous Friday. And he had given me the results late in, late in the day on the 30th. And we travelled uh, the next day to Groningen. So I had, I had that information with me. Um, and then we have the information from the symposium in Groningen, 1st and 2nd of November 1984. What you say, in, um, or what's said in, in, in this chronology for that date is the PFC attendees, and that's Dr. Perry, Dr. Yu, and is that Dr. McLeod? No, it's Dr. McIntosh. Dr. McIntosh, sorry. Agree that the SNBTS should dry heat its existing factor rate as soon as possible. So... Is that the date upon which the decision is taken, effectively, to move from pasteurisation to dry heating? That was the date on which we agreed that we should recommend this to Professor Cash. And Dr Perry went to see Dr Cash immediately on the Monday morning to get his approval to, to do that. And he agreed that that's, that was what we should do. Um, and we see the, the, the entry for the 5th of November, which no doubt I can ask Dr Perry about, um, uh, um, is the records and acceptance by Dr. Cash of that recommendation. And then if we just go further down, um, we can see 7th of November is recall of factor nine concentrate. I don't need to ask you about that. 14th of November, PFC albumin pasteurization cabinets validated for dry heat treatment of factor eight at 68 degrees centigrade for two hours. Can you just explain to us what that's referring to? Yes, the pasteurization cabinets were used to, to pasteurize albumin, which was heated at 60 degrees for, for, for 10 hours, but fortuitously the cabinets were designed to operate up to 70 degrees so we could actually increase the temperature up to 68 degrees and use the same heat treatment system that was used to pasteurise bottles of albumin. Prior to this, all of the studies had been done in water baths in laboratories, which wasn't a procedure that you could use for your clinical grade product. And so um, this allowed us to move forward before we obtained specialist ovens, which uh, BPL were having, having made for their product. Um, we, could, we could do it before we got those ovens. We could proceed immediately. Now, um, as I understand it from documents elsewhere, the, the dry heat treated product was then available for issue from the 10th of December 1984. So within a little over a, a month from um, the, the, the Groningen conference and, and the recommendation that you and your colleagues agree that heat-treated product was available for, for distribution to clinicians and treatment for patients. Given how quickly you were, PFC was able to, to put that into place once the decision had been taken and the recommendation formulated and accepted by Professor Cash, is there any reason why that couldn't have been done earlier? in 1984 at least, once you, um, if you'd appreciated the viability of dry heating at an earlier stage? Because there's no evidence that it would be effective against the agent that caused AIDS. Um, can I then just ask you to look at your witness statement and an observation in relation to factor nine? Um, so if it's WITN 6914001. We go to page 35. Um, pick it up um, at paragraph numbered Roman numerals 2. When research began at PFC on the pasteurization of coagulation factors. The possibility that heat-treated factor IX might be thrombogenic was a major concern to Dr. Cash. He believed that a suitable animal model should be determined to, to be established to determine safety in this respect. PFL was invited to collaborate in the study with Dr. Smith agreeing to do so, and then f further detail is, is given 
in, in, in that regard. So, um, is it right to understand from this, Dr. Cash's perspective, as, as, as you believed it to be, was that he didn't, he wasn't prepared to allow uh, heat-treated factor nine to be used for the treatment of, of, of humans um, until the possibility of a possi of the hazard of thrombosis could be ruled out. That's correct. Um, can, we can take that down. I just want to ask you then a number of more general observations in relation to the development of, of, of heat treatment. Um, you referred earlier to the thinking that heat treatment was um, inconceivable, notwithstanding the knowledge in relation to pasteurization and albumin. Um, in general terms, is it part of the, the function of research scientists to, to think the unthinkable? It was so inconceivable that it literally wasn't something that I would have imagined could have been possible. It wasn't something, it was so inconceivable that I literally didn't conceive of it. it. It obviously was being conceived by some because not least Sparingberg had, was doing some, some, some work, the patent from 1979, the, the information disclosed at the, the Bonn conference in, in, in October 1980. So, and, and, and leave aside what else was going on in other pharmaceutical companies, there were scientists around the world who, who did think, um, beginning or, or in the late 1970s, I'll have to look at the precise dates and perhaps in other hearings, but who did think the unthinkable. What, what, what can, was can it I just that, comment yes, on that? Because absolutely. My understanding is of the, the way this was discovered, that... that they didn't set out to do that. They kind of discovered it accidentally. So that it actually wasn't conceivable to them. It just happened as an accidental um, side effect, if you like. And then they realized, well, maybe this is a possibility. But that, so even, I don't think even they sort of said, let's start thinking about heat treatment uh, from scratch. It was something that they stumbled on accidentally. Um, the, the the underlying science of, of heat treatment um, was, was, was understood and known. There was nothing particularly novel about heat treatment as a, as a concept, was there? No. In, in terms of the reason why um, the heat treatment of factor eight wasn't developed earlier, what, what was the main missing piece of, of knowledge? Was it how to maintain the stability of the product? Yes. And was that the result of um, uh, a lack of technological advances? Was there not the, the, the relevant substances or, or equipment available? Or was it just that scientists had not yet worked out what the solution might be? It was a lack of knowledge about factor eight. The factor eight molecule wasn't defined, I mean, it wasn't purified until Ted Tudnam did it in the mid-1980s. And in the 1970s, it wasn't even known what factor eight was. Some people thought it was a carbohydrate. The size of the molecule wasn't known. It, when I got involved, it was called the factor eight complex. And it turns out that the measurements we were making of that were actually detecting the von Willebrand protein, not the factor eight protein. What, how the factor eight protein was biochemically put together wasn't known at all. What was known, that it was highly unstable. Uh, even at room, at room temperature and at slightly warmer temperatures, the activity was lost quite quickly. Um, so the, it seemed to be the idea of heating dis wasn't, wasn't conceivable. Because heating in a way that you had to destroy a virus as well, that just wasn't just heating on, on its own. Um, the, the, the research and development department at, at PFC um, w was, not, was not a huge department. Um, I, I don't know whether you're able to um, provide us with any assistance in understanding um, what the relative resources were available to private pharmaceutical companies compared to what might be available to PFC or PFL and BPL. No, I, I'm sorry, I can't answer that. But I, I could just say one, one other point about you, you, you said, have you not conceived of heat treatment earlier? 
what I, what I had done is approached a couple of university academic groups and to, 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 to discuss areas of potential collaboration. And in one of these groups, I remember saying one area that would be like to collaborate on is how to eliminate the risk of hepatitis from factor eight concentrates. And they just looked at me as I had stepped out of a spaceship that they could possibly work on something like that. At this even at an academic level, it was just inconceivable to them. And I never got invited back. Um, do you think, looking back now, if, if PFC had had greater resources, um, that you might have been able to develop a heat-treated product earlier? No, I don't. Um, and why is that? Because I think, the, as I say, the, the, work, the, the, the way it was discovered was a series of ac accidental discoveries made by certain people, and then that led, opened up the way. And I can't, I don't think that would necessarily have happened at PFC if we'd had more staff. It was just happened, it was just circumstances. In, in that one particular company. Again, looking back now with the, all the knowledge that, that you now have, do, do you think that PFC should have embarked upon work relating to pasteurization earlier than it did? No, I don't, because I think what was most critical was evidence that the viruses could be destroyed by these processes. and. The agent for non-A and non-B hadn't been discovered. The agent for AIDS hadn't been discovered. And so nobody could work out how, how, how to deal with them. How do you remove something that hasn't been discovered? I mean, it is not, it's not straightforward. And it, I would say that if, if, if progress, for progress to have been made faster, those viruses, if those viruses had been discovered sooner, then progress could have been made sooner. But that was the main stumbling block in my mind, or one of the stumbling blocks. Progress was, of course, made in relation to non-A, non-B hepatitis before hepatitis C itself was discovered. That's correct. But that was based on um, extremely difficult um, studies in patients, which we, we didn't uh, carry out in Scotland. Um, and then... If I can ask you a similar question to the question I asked a few moments ago, but in relation to, to dry heat um, work, um, do you think, looking back now, that PFC ought to have started its work on dry heat, which was being done elsewhere, um, albeit that your own knowledge of that would not necessarily have been very extensive? But do you think PFC should have started work on dry heat earlier than it did? No, I don't. I, I think we, as you say, we're a very small organisation. We have to be focused. If you try to do everything, you end up doing nothing. So we were being focused on what we thought the evidence pointed to, to working best, being aware that other people were working on dry heat treat, treatment and knowing that they would share their data with us, like Dr Smith, if it became um, stronger. Would it be fair to characterise the failure to attempt to heat treat concentrates earlier? And this isn't simply, this is a general question rather than a question specifically aimed at either your work, Dr. Foster, or the PFC's work. Fair to characterise that failure um, as a failure of imagination rather than lack of, of technology? No, I, I think that's unfair. And I think if you look at the history, there have been attempts to heat materials, including plasma and a whole host of different methods using UV radiation and chemicals through the 1950s and 1960s, and they'd all resulted in failure. And so it, people ha had been using their imaginations, I think, uh, but they'd come to a dead end. And I did have this conversation with Dr. Johnston very late on in his career. He said he'd tried dry heat treatment, he'd tried pasteurization, and it failed. So it wasn't a lack of imagination. It was, it was a lack of knowledge. Um, what, what do you say then would have been required in order to achieve heat treatment at an earlier stage? What I said a moment ago, having, having those viruses discovered earlier and then knowing um, whether they were heat sensitive or sensitive to chemicals, what the nature of the virus was, would have opened up avenues for research, 
And of course, that's what happened when the HIV virus was announced by Gallo. Immediate work was done on determining whether it would be destroyed by heat, and that led actually very quickly to heat treatment being brought into use within a few months. Um, and as you pointed out, um, it, it was possible to, to, to determine that certain methods of heat treatment were effective against non-A, non-B, but only by very difficult studies in, in a very small patient group. Um, I just want to move next, before we break, um, to ask you a handful of questions regarding um, Z8. So if we move into 1985... Just, just yes. before we, we do that, can I, can I ask this? Um, when uh, albumin uh, was first heat treated, was I think back in the very early 50s, or maybe late 40s, am I right? 1945. Uh, and when it was first heat treated, was it was it heat treated in the presence of a stabilizer? It was, yes. So, without the stabilizer, could it have been heat treated? No, it couldn't. So it was known that at least with some proteins, the presence of a stabilizer might be important. The question then was finding an appropriate stabilizer. That's correct. Thank you. Um, if, if we m move into 1985, um, and I don't need to trouble you with the precise dates which we, we, we have documented, um, the product that um, was then being produced by BPL, the 8Y product, the product that was being produced by PFC, um, um, which, which was, was in due course determined to inactivate not just HIV but also non-A, non-B hepatitis. The product that was being produced by PFC did not at that point in time inactivate non-A, non-B hepatitis. That, that's right, isn't that's it? That's correct. Um, um, again, looking back now, what do you think... Um, what was it that enabled BPL to get there earlier than PFC in terms of being able to have available for issue to patients a, a factor concentrate that inactivated both viruses? They made a number of, um, uh, one, one discovery that was kind of accidental, um, which led to them developing a product that in the it, PFL could withstand heating at 80 degrees. That was a remarkable achievement. Um, I think it was astonished everybody who knew of it. Um, whether that could be sustained in a full-scale production at, at, um, at Elstree wasn't known until they actually started doing the production in late 85. So in fact, there was no certain information that that would, would, would stand up. It was quite, I mean, the history of factor eight is littered with false dawns. It was quite possible that that might have failed when it got to full-scale manufacture. So I think people were keeping very, were very interested to know if that would work. But it was they, they, they were doing really pioneering work, uh, and we were watching it quite closely. And and what was the point in time at which at PFC, um, it, it was decided to. Uh, um, Switch to a model of uh, the model of heating that BPL had had introduced. That was late '85, and it's a quite a complicated story. But prior to that, we had been working on developing a, very, a much higher purified factor eight in conjunction with Dr. Alan Johnson. The reason given for eight Y being able to withstand this degree of heat treatment was that it was more highly purified. That then led us to believe that our product could be heated even more severely than 8Y if that was necessary to destroy the non-A, non-B hepatitis. So we thought what we were doing was consistent with what they were doing and could take us beyond what they were doing if that was needed. But that, that picture changed near the end of 1985 when we reached the point where we freeze-dried some of our very high purity substance, factor 8 concentrate in the research laboratory, 
and it didn't withstand freeze drying. We then had to design a new freeze drying process and then we found that it did withstand freeze drying but it didn't withstand heat treatment to 80 degrees even though it was very highly purified which was completely the opposite of what we'd expected. But what we did discover was that a sample of the existing factor eight that had been included in that, in that experiment as a control did withstand dry heat treatment at 80 degrees. And that told us that BPL's success wasn't because their product was more highly purified. It suggested it was because it was the way it had been freeze dried. And we then began to explore that with Dr. Smith and that his, his um, account of their freeze drying process was consistent with our observations. And that led us to, to take a decision that we should then move to apply um, modify our exist, uh, something that was a, a, very, a modified version of a lower purity product that we could do as quickly as possible to apply 80 degree heat treatment. But the, one of the factors that caused us to do that wasn't because we thought it would inactivate non-A, non-B. It was because there was a, a manuscript submitted to the Lancet by Dr. Prince that rate caused, caused, suggested that the existing dry heat treatment procedures might not be as effective against HIV as everyone believed. And we were concerned that this would undermine uh, confidence in our existing product and we should move as quickly as possible to a product that was heated more severely. And so we, we then embarked on that uh, as quickly as we could do, possibly do it. If, if there'd been closer alignment between PFC and BPL and, and PFL with more parallel uh, R&D and operational processes. Um, would it have been, um, do you think that the production and issue of, of what eventually became the heat-treated Z8 in, in, in Scotland, would that have been advanced? No, I think it would have actually gone backwards because we discovered what we believe was actually what, what was happening with it, why, which BPL didn't appreciate. And I think if we hadn't done it, done it the hard way, if you like, we would never have found that information. We probably would have failed to be able to reproduce their work. Other people tried to reproduce their work and they failed because they didn't understand. And I don't think BPL fully understood what they'd, what they'd achieved or how they'd achieved it. Um, so I've, I've got a handful of further questions relating to 8Y and, and, and um, uh, uh, Dr. Smith's reports of his results, but it requires looking at a few documents. So I wonder if I could do that at two rather than starting now. Uh, yes, well, let, let, let's uh, let's do that, and we'll take a take a break until um, two o'clock. Two o'clock.